Hello, Lighthouse. I'm Wes Terasaki, and I have the privilege of putting together some video presentations for our Bible study series on the book of Nehemiah. Bible study is something I really enjoy doing, so I'm looking forward to our time together. Let's get started. Let me introduce you to Nehemiah. As we begin, you may have some questions like, who in the world was Nehemiah? Why is there a book named after him, and what's in it? Of all the books in the Bible, why is our church studying this one? Well, we'll try to answer these questions, but before we do, I want you to know that as we go along, I plan to present some Bible study tips that I think will help us do a better job of reading and understanding God's Word. The Bible study tip for today is to learn to use introductions to the books of the Bible, especially if the books are unfamiliar to you. These are introductory articles written by Bible scholars that give us the background and sometimes a summary of the books of the Bible. Some of you have probably used these regularly, and some of you have never used them, but they give us a wealth of useful information. They help us more accurately interpret God's Word. They give us insights on the people and times of the ancient Near East, so we have an idea of the context in which the story of God unfolds. Of course, reading what someone says about the Bible is not a substitute for reading the Bible itself, but it can help orient us and make things much clearer. So, where do we find these Bible book introductions? We find them in introduction books, surveys of the Bible, and Bible handbooks, study Bibles, commentaries, some Bible dictionaries and encyclopedias, and online sources. You can see that these things are widely available. I think everyone should have a resource library for studying God's Word, even if it's only a handful of books, and we should have at least one good reference that contains a reliable introduction for each book of the Bible. Okay, so that's the tip for this week. Make use of Bible book introductions. Consider reading one whenever you first start the study of a new book. Now let's talk about Nehemiah. It is part of the continuing saga of God and his people. Some of you may not know where Nehemiah is located in your Bible or how it fits with the rest of the Old Testament, and that's okay. We'll go through this together. Starting from the beginning, Genesis tells us about the creation of the world and mankind. We see God creating and choosing the nation of Israel. Exodus describes the people of Israel enslaved in Egypt and how God frees them. In Leviticus, God shows his people how to live in ways that honor him and each other. And in Numbers, they journey to the land he promised them. Deuteronomy is all about preparing to enter that land. Those five books we call the Pentateuch, or in Hebrew, the Torah. Joshua, Judges, and Ruth are the stories of Israel in this new land. Eventually, Israel becomes a monarchy, and 1st and 2nd Samuel and 1st and 2nd Kings are the stories of Israel, first as a single united kingdom, and then later split into separate northern and southern nations. Although there is some overlap with Samuel and Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles is really the prelude to the stories of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, which are the last three historical books in our modern Old Testament. In these books we see the failures of Israel, the consequences of their sin, and the period in history when Israel ceased to exist as an independent nation. So you see, Genesis through Esther comprise one super long story that is told in 17 books. It is the historical framework in which we can fit all the rest of the Old Testament. Nehemiah is the conclusion of this extended narrative. It sets the stage for the intertestamental period after Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, leading up to the beginning of the New Testament and the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. To tell the story of Nehemiah, we might go back 1,500 years to the man Abraham. God had promised to make him the father of a great nation, the nation of Israel. To Moses, God promised to establish the Israelites in a land of their own. And later he told the Israelite king David that there would be a lasting kingdom ruled by one of David's descendants. But these promises were contingent on the people remaining faithful to God and his promises, and they were not. They intermarried with people from other nations and adopted their ways and false gods. 
Finally, God allowed part of the nation to be destroyed by Assyria, and then the remainder to be conquered by Babylon. Some of the surviving Israelites escaped to other countries. Some were forcibly taken to Babylon, which is modern-day Iraq, and some of the most helpless were simply left behind to fend for themselves. We see something of the life of the exiles in Babylon in the books of Daniel and Ezekiel. But what had happened to God's promises to Abraham, Moses, and David? No longer called Israelites, the people were now called Jews. They were on the brink of extinction, and their situation could not be more desperate. But God never gave up on his people. He was going to restore them, restore their relationship with him, restore their cities and temple, and eventually bring forth a descendant of King David to save the world. Ezra and Nehemiah is the story of how God made good on his promises. This is what the Lord says, In the time of my favor I will answer you, and in the day of salvation I will help you. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people, to restore the land and to reassign its desolate inheritances, to say to the captives, Come out. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will bring my people Israel and Judah back from captivity and restore them to the land I gave their ancestors to possess, says the Lord. For I will take you out of the nations, I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. It is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I am going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name. Just as God used a foreign power to remove the Israelites from their land years before, he now used another foreign power to bring them back. Persia defeated Babylon, and the new Persian king Cyrus made a remarkable decree. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, he has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem, and may the force be with you. Nah, just kidding. Even better, may their God be with them. This decree which fulfills a prophecy in Isaiah, is quoted at the end of Chronicles, as well as the beginning of the book we know as Ezra. Here is a map of the ancient lands held by Persia around the time of Nehemiah, about 500 years before Christ. The lands controlled by the Persians are colored in green. The area of Judah was called Beyond the River, or Trans-Euphrates, because from Persia it was the territory beyond, that is west of, the Euphrates River. Several waves of Jews made it back to Jerusalem. The first was led by a Jewish leader named Zerubbabel and encouraged by the prophets Haggai and Zechariah. This was followed years later by a group led by the priest and scribe Ezra. On this map, we see the original route of exile as a red line from Jerusalem to Babylon. The return routes are in green and purple. Other scattered Jews migrated back to their homeland as well. The people rebuilt the temple, and scholars refer to this as the second temple, and the people found themselves back in Judah. But they were still under Persian rule, heavily taxed, unclear about what God expected of them, and thoroughly infiltrated with different types of religions and superstitions. They were unprotected and surrounded by hostile nations, and attempts to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem were strongly resisted. Around 445 BC, in the Persian capital of Susa, we first meet the man Nehemiah. He is given permission by the king of Persia to travel to Judah and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. This is the extraordinary adventure we are about to study because it's not only about the rebuilding of walls, but the renewing of lives, faith, and a national identity. Nehemiah is a story worth knowing 
meditating upon and remembering. We need to know what Christian leadership looks like. Nehemiah shows us. We need to see how to respond to opposition and adversity and to our own disappointments and discouragement. Nehemiah shows us. We need to learn to pray again, to worship again, to humble ourselves before God again, to be generous again. Nehemiah shows us these things too. We need to have hope, focus, and vision. And above all, we can see God's faithfulness, sovereignty, and ultimate plan. Please join me in this endeavor, won't you? This is an exciting time for our church to read Nehemiah and learn more of what it means to be the people of God.